I guess the place to start is sort of with looking at the notion that uh, the dawning paradigm of postmodern consciousness seems to be the growing awareness that we don't know what is happening at all, <laughs> that all of the models whose implications have been worked out over the past 500 years or so have come to a place where they are now recursive and they no longer can be pushed forward as models of explanation. In other words, they are completed and ontological analysis of how they work now shows us the limitations of their application to reality. They just simply cannot, there is not more blood to be squeezed from the stone of science. There may be further discoveries, but further growth and understanding along those lines now seems unlikely, what with complementarity principle, Bell's theorem, the primacy of language and the formation of ontology. All these things show the relative power of science to account for reality, where before it was assumed that science would ultimately give a good account of reality. So postmodern living is living in the light of the fact that that faith has dissolved away and that we're now living in some kind of intellectual free space or fire-free zone where everything is up for grabs. And the, uh, the 20th century's fascination with the archaic, with shamanism and uh, breakdown of perception through modern art, exploration of the unconscious through psychoanalysis, mass political movements, all of these things relate to this fascination with the archaic, which is an effort on the part of the culture to stabilize itself because we really have, having seen the limitations of science, we have discovered we are in a small rowboat in a dark ocean and we're being swept we know not where. So all past tradition is searched, magical traditions, alchemical traditions, lost philosophical traditions, pre-literate tribal traditions. Everything is frantically searched for a key. And while there are consoling perceptions that arise out of this search through all this other extended human knowledge, there haven't yet emerged certain answers about what is going on. This is why several people last night referred to how weird the time is, how hopeful we are with so little reason uh, on the surface to be hopeful. And uh, it's because the gelling out of this historical problem is happening right now, and it's not clear uh, what it will become. Meetings like this our efforts to uh, build an understanding of it. It doesn't appear that it's going to filter down through the transformation of institutions of control. It appears more like it's going to be some kind of proletarian uh, upwelling of a shift of point of view. Now, the shorthand way of saying what I just said is that we now know that we don't know anything. And things like uh, the psychedelic experience and the use of psychedelic plants throws open doorways that science was able to successfully keep closed during its heyday because they were areas where the number of variables exceeded science's power of description and therefore they said, well, we'll just keep driving straight ahead and we'll go up those rivers later. But now that is all changed and the exploration of uh, the existential dimension of not knowingness, which psychedelics makes possible, is what is forming modern people I think. I mean, people who will be seen to have led lives that were relevant 50 years from now or 100 years from now, people who had actually figured out the context of 
the world they were living in and tried to come to terms with it. And um, this morning, I think we want to talk about uh, plants and how they relate to the planet. But before we do that, I want to paint a picture for you of a, of a mandala, which then I will discuss later in other meetings. But my notion of, of what the postmodern person's mandalic projection onto the world should be in terms of a map of understanding is a, uh, a quadrated circle in which psychedelics and feminism and cybernetics and space travel are the four parts of the circle. And in the center of the circle, looking backwards in time, there is a category that I would call conservation, which means conservation of the planet, conservation of traditional and historical knowledge, conservation of values, conservation in the sense of intelligence husbanding the planet. And when the mandala is flipped over and you look through it into the future, conservation has been replaced by art. Art is the ultimate expression of this transformation of uh, unorganized matter into ideas which human beings carry on. And we carry it on in a technical mode out of necessity, but in the artistic mode out of a kind of upwelling of ecstatic self-expression about the universe. So conservation is the way we relate to the past, and human history is seen as an object of collective artifice making in the future, culminating in the notion of, uh, of the flying saucer. To do this, we have to completely redesign our understanding of reality, which in terms of practical experience will mean that reality itself will appear to be redesigned. And I touched on this just for a moment last night when I mentioned plants and said how admiring I was of them because they, subs they exist on sunlight, air, and earth, and that this is what we have to learn to do in order to release spirit out of the ape matrix that we're bound in. And strangely enough, the way this is to be done, apparently, is by a redefining of the nature of the biological world in relationship to this other kingdom of being, which we call plants. Plants represent some kind of entire other dimension of existence of which we view the topological manifestation of the form, but are completely occluded as to the network of energy and information that this represents. And like the zoological kingdom, which has uh, thousands of forms of expression and progressively more complex forms which culminate in self-reflecting primates, the vegetable kingdom seems to have intelligent species and gradations of awareness in the world so that we are opening a dialogue at the end of history with this other form in the biosphere which we are just beginning to cognize as our own understanding about what the world is really about falls into focus. And certainly a hundred years ago, no one would have thought that this was in the direct line of historical development of the high-tech civilizations, that they would have to explore the mind of the vegetable plant goddess who was the only force contending with them for control of the planet. That's what it's come down to. When you take a longer slice, you realize that the individual, the existence of the individual is like an illusion, and that really the planet is involved in some kind of chemical process which is like a gene swarming. 
and it's been going on for a billion years with more and more and, and animals and plants uh, as species and as individuals are just uh, aggregates of genes of varying degrees of permanence. The individual is a very impermanent aggregate of genes. The species has a slightly longer duration. But what's really happening is these information transferring molecules are just swarming on the surface of the planet and controlling, as you mentioned, the weather, the chemistry of the soils, the rate of heat transfer. They've discovered now that Plankton control weather in the oceans by controlling the surface reflectivity. The question, I think, is the peculiar dualism in the world of information. Why does it seem that reality is not reality? Why are there co-present, actually, two worlds are co-present in our experience? This is the taboo subject that we're here to talk about, the weird fact that there are two worlds, one of which our culture doesn't acknowledge, but we all experience. That's a very uh, schizophrenic situation to be in. We all exist in both of these worlds, but our language, our culture, our institutions tell us, no, there's only one world. We have gotten into this lethal cul-de-sac where by not acknowledging the second world, we have, uh, have veered off on a tangent which is, uh, threatens our extinction now. This obsession with control of world one, matter, energy, and the complete ignoring of the world of consciousness which stood in front of it and manipulated it, but just taking that as a given has created this fantastically imbalanced culture. I think that gets back to the plants as teachers because uh, since we do, as in your words, play with fire as human beings, perhaps the question you were asking as to the plants as being teachers, my feeling was at the time was they're in communication with us as we are in communication with them. We're all transparent beings. You're talking genes swarming on the planet. There's no um, safe in which we lock our own human knowledge, it's, we're transparent to all around us. And uh, If you get into intelligent plants, which is what we were talking about earlier, perhaps, I mean, if you follow that logically out, why not have teachers as chemicals? That's mm -hmm. how they can manifest within this particular body and do use the library card, as you say. They realize that we're doers and shapers. Well, I think there's only one life on the planet, though, and to say that we're separate from the plants or from this or from the air is a fallacy. So yeah. that's a great image, the growing transparency. That's, that's a good idea for what the end of history is. Mm -hmm. It's that everything becomes clearer and clearer and clearer, and as it becomes clearer, boundaries disintegrate, and everything is seen to be of the same... Uh, of the same stuff. Well, I think for much of the world, um, and still, for instance, in the Amazon and other cultures where it tuned into nature, it was very transparent for very, very long. Progress was the losing of that transparency and the, you know, forging ahead of certain parts of it, and and almost to the point of just either eliminating uh, to extinction or to the extinction of memory. The the lessons. One day, I was just, I think I was doing bookkeeping or something very mundane, and um, the, uh, the little voice that in interrupts every once in a while said, um, a plant teacher is a teacher who has taken the form of a plant. And then that raised all these questions for me, you know, because does that mean there are teachers floating around looking for places to land, right, and ways to interface with the other species? Or And, and you know, I mean, I've always thought of rocks, big rocks and many places in the world. You can sit on them and you can just hear them, you know, and feel them. <laughs> really. I'm sure you're, you know Rupert Sheldrake's theory. Well, it's basically the idea that things of like kind resonate together. And uh, when I've thought about this problem before about LSD and where does it fit into all of this, LSD is in... Uh, 
is in the morning glories of central Mexico and the far Pacific. And I think that what makes a plant teacher complex is how many people it's taken. And that a plant that has been used a 100,000 years is filled with all of the contents of the minds of the people who took it over that time. But I want to introduce the notion that life, the plants and the animals, are intrusions into three-dimensional space of some kind of topological manifold of a higher order. You see, the way in which a chair differs from a giraffe is that if you, if you slice through the chair and then come back and examine it 12 hours later, it will be the same. But the giraffe will have changed radically. This is because by cutting into the giraffe, you have intruded into the temporal dimension of its existence. It is more like a musical note than an object. It must be born, grow, mature, and die. It, it, and that process, growth, maturity, and death, is how three-dimensional beings like ourselves describe the intrusion of these hyperdimensional vortices into our world. That's the mystery of life cannot be encompassed in three dimensions. Life is a hyperdimensional object. All hyperdimensional objects are organisms, whether they be societies or animals. So the question of what is the plant, you know, when you ask yourself, what am I? What you immediately concentrate on is your, what philosophers call your internal horizon of transcendence. You look into yourself to understand yourself. When we try to describe a plant, we inevitably give a topological mapping of it, how it appears to us, its uptake of minerals, its surface reflectivity, its weight. But the plant obviously experiences itself very differently. All life has an internal horizon of transcendence toward which it aims. It's, um, Whitehead called it appetition. It's, uh, it's inclusion of sensory data out of which it maps being. But what the nature of this higher dimension is that these vortices are intruding into our dimension from is absolutely anybody's guess. I mean, you can call it a mathematical conundrum or a religious mystery, but it's what's making the world happen. It's what, how uh, the mystery of our being will eventually be shed one more level of uh, veil to let us understand it. You see, an organism is a, a chemical system which does not run down the, the second law of thermodynamics says that the whole universe tends toward the dissipation of structure and the release of energy and heat, and then everything, all structure, all energy is dissipated. But the uh, life has achieved the miracle of by being an open system and taking material into it and extracting energy from it and getting rid of waste, uh, life has been able to leave the main uh, stream of thermodynamic degradation and establish itself at an equilibrium point off that graph and maintain itself there for at least on this planet alone four billion years. Now the average life of a star in this galaxy is on the order of two and a half billion years. Some last longer. But that means that biology is no epiphenomenon, no iridescence off the surface of matter, as the 19th century physicalists wanted to describe it. It means that life is uh, indicative of a physics of higher dimensions, which intrudes into this otherwise thermodynamically degra degrading system, which we call the physical universe. And uh, information, there seems to be an informational ghost of this universe, which is somehow co-present at all points within the matrix, perhaps a la Bell's theorem or something like that. And that's what the psychedelic experience shows you. It shows you 
a hologrammatic space of information where by sitting still in your room and sending the mind, you can cross the universe in an instant, you know, and return. And the question of, is this real, is in bad taste. <laughs> it, it violates the two ontological categories, you see. I, I mean, uh, it just isn't done. <laughs> but you're right. <laughs> And, but the plants seem to be the things which shake us out of these cultural conventions. We have this very bad habit of, uh, of when we encounter a new experience, we describe it. And as we describe it, we erase its reality reduce it. and replace it with a map. And forever after, when we encounter that input, we access the map and overlay it over the thing and say, aha, oh, I know what this is. And, and so by the time a child is five years old, they have completely entered into a symbolic construct which hides the real world from them. And uh, fortunately, uh, these plant teachers seem to have the unique ability of showing you the relativity of language, which for us is the relativity of being. And then you are freed because you have seen something incontrovertible. There's no going back then. You know, you are, that is the great first gateway on the path to realize the relativity of language and the, and the malleability of, of, of the world. Coming out into the desert is uh, typical of people seeking visions. The first thing you have to do is leave the polis. Culture is this effort to hold back the mystery and in replace it with a mythology, which is then in the control of those who recite that mythology, whether they be shamans or priests. This holding back of reality is the strain, is what Christian theo theologians call the fall, our strange alienation from nature that causes us to crowd into cities and mint money and uh, put a price on everything. And this is why it's so important to go back to the Amazon and eastern Indonesia and these places and try and understand what spark it was that those people kept you know, over the millennia, while we became the prodigal son and wandered into matter and, to, you know, hoard in the cities on the plain and have now come full circle and returned at the end of history with the dilemma that we have made such a mess of things that there's nothing we can do now but lay. Each stage is a greater distancing from the wellspring of being and it's brought us, you know, to the valley of dry bones, to the valley of the apocalypse. And uh, now the fat is in the fire. Now we'll find out what stuff man is made of as uh, the chickens come home to roost. <laughs> But, well, no, I, I'm very optimistic. I just... <laughs> Is it my metaphors or my pessimism? Oh, the horrible metaphors. The metaphors. I'm used yes, to Yes, well, <clears throat> the uh, rhetorical hyperbole, <laughs> unbridled. I did ask a question about this, uh, this two-world thing, because um, it interests me greatly. Do you think that there's two worlds or that there's... Um, Many, many yes, well, I, I think you're right. I mean, but there are different orders of different worlds. I mean, I, I guess it was the physicist Wheeler who thought that every time there was a choice, the universe took both paths and had always done this <laughs> so that the number uh, and kinds of universes was, uh, you know, staggering. Right. <laughs> I don't, I find that cumbersome. <laughs> and, uh, but there certainly seem to be a number of, of universes and there seem to be different kinds of universes. For instance, uh, you can tune from channel to channel, but some of them you can't make 
heads and tails out of, you know? <laughs> it's just too far away from your conceptual schema for you to be... So it's sort of like watching uh, ideological mandalas or something. You can't say much about it afterwards, but it certainly was compelling while it was going on. And... Uh, well, I don't know, Robin. You've, you're such a skillful questioner. You've brought yourself to the doorway of my most recent mania. Maybe I should unburden myself briefly about it. <clears throat> One of the weird things about, about growth or trying to make your ideas always become new is that you always assume you're going to, uh, to uh, know what the next step is that even though you're going to become more and more enlightened, there won't be any surprises. In, and uh, <laughs> So a few weeks ago, I was meditating in my usual fashion, and uh, <laughs> I began to get this new idea, which was so weird that I immediately shifted into, uh -huh, this, is, this is not the truth. This is not a transmission about the nature of reality. This is a plot for a science fiction novel that I, <laughs> that I should write and tried to hold that as the defense. That was my shield against the onslaught of this thing. And I've never been one for Atlantis or Lemuria or all these invisible prehistoric lands and places that people enjoy so much. But I was told a very funny thing, which I will share with you. It's... Uh, a funny idea. Now, let's see. How does it go? It has two versions, one of which speaks a scientific language. The other speaks a mythological language. Okay, so the scientific language goes like this. There's something in the universe called a fractal soliton of improbability. This means it's a unicate event. It only happens once in the lifetime of a universe. You can think of it as a wavelength with one wave. That's why it's called a soliton. And if one of the and these things move not in ordinary three-dimensional space, but but in some kind of much higher spatial manifold, and when they collide with a planet, or when one collides with a planet in a universe, the time stream of that planet is divided and two copies of the entire planet spring into existence without either having any knowledge of it. It just is something which happens. So this voice was telling me that uh, this had happened to the Earth and that this was the secret that we were all striving to understand was that a, an event in the past had actually divided our time stream and that a twin of this planet had come into being in another dimension. Okay, so that's the scientific explanation of it. So the mythological explanation was that, there, that the universe, it's Gnostic, that the universe is the creation of a demiurge, not the highest expression of divinity, but a kind of demon, a fallen creature and that this demiurge was able to coax itself into being and actually incarnate into history as a human being, and that when this happened, this was then the mythological expression of the fractal soliton of improbability. And when it happened, the time stream split. The universe is the creation of the demiurge, and the demiurge impelled itself in in the form of an individual. Right. And this is sort of, you know... Waited a long time. When you're a demiurge, <laughs> who can hurry? <laughs> okay, go ahead. Okay, so, so the time-splitting event had to do with the career of Christ, who was an extraordinary manifestation of energy in the historical time stream, not to be confused with a Buddha or a Mohammed or a Zoroaster, who were great saints, and uh, it, it was something else. It was, in some sense, what it claimed to be, but in some sense, okay? So now, 
at the moment of, and you can choose either the Immaculate Conception or the Resurrection, depending on which side of the bed you got up on today. <laughs> but at that moment, the time stream split, and this other place came into being without having any awareness. that, And they were identical at that moment, these two worlds. Now, Christ had no children. So, oh, what I forgot to say was that the event, the fractal soliton of improbability, has this quantum mechanical half charge so that in one of the universes it happens. In the other universe it doesn't happen. And so everything about these two worlds was the same except that in one of them the Immaculate Conception had not taken place or the Resurrection had not taken place. Now, because Christ had no children, in the world in which he was absent, it was not a genetic line which was missing. It was an ideological line which never received expression. And consequently, as time passed, first decades and then centuries, the absence of this particular intellectual influence in the world changed the world radically in the following way. Greek science did not suffer the suppression that occurred with the conversion of Constantine. The academies were not closed. The hermetic knowledge was not repressed. Conversely, the empire was stronger and was able to repel the barbarian invasions of the second to the fifth century. And, and mathematics, which had halted in our world at Diophantus, proceeded through his disciple Hypatia to develop a calculus by A.D. 370 so that the millennium of Christian stasis that occurred in our world did not occur in that world. And as time passed and engineering advances occurred, by around 850, they had ships which were able to cross the Atlantic Ocean and they encountered the Mayan civilization reaching its fullest flower on, in Guatemala and on the Yucatan Peninsula. And in fact, in this vision, I saw the Roman emperor Cosmodorus V make a pilgrimage to Tikal in 920 to be present at the coronation of a king at the end of Bakhtun VIII. <coughs> anyway, this Greco-Roman imperial culture immediately recognized the genius of the Mayans in mathematics and astronomy, and, and Europe was transformed into a, an amalgamation, a Greco-Mayan civilization with the... Uh, <laughs> so let me see. <laughs> and and this civilization continued to develop. Now, one of the influences which the Mayans brought into Europe around the year 950 was their extremely sophisticated psychopharmacopoeia and shamanism. And this mated with Neoplatonism and Hermeticism so that rather than science developing as it developed in our world, a kind of magical psychopharmacolytic technology of thought and understanding was what was developed over the centuries. And then in later centuries, centuries before it happened in our world, they contacted the Orient and the Sung, the dynastic influence of the Sung, poured itself into the creation of a global civilization such that by around 1200 AD, they were able to land on the moon and create a cybernetic global civilization similar to the kind we have now. They continued evolving with all this psychotronic and shamanically derived and now, by this time, you can imagine it was an unbelievably exotic and alien uh, civilization compared to our own. The fruits of their psychedelic and psychoanalytic investigations into higher space was the discovery of our world. They found out <laughs> what had happened. They figured it out by studying dreams 
And by making deep journeys into the psychedelic space, they were able to discover our sleeping unconscious with its repository of the legacy of the Christian centuries under the reign of this demiurgic ideology. And they conceived of the notion of saving us. <laughs> 